Good morning and welcome to the second week of online Covenant College everything. As this new semester has settled in, I'm actually uh, finding that I've been a little bit more off balance than I expected to be. My normal rhythms and structures of daily life have been altered just enough that I'm having to see and create new rhythms and new structures and new habits. Uh, I'm guessing I'm not alone in that. I'm guessing that most of us are feeling that pretty acutely. And I pray that chapel has been something of a positive rhythm and structure in your lives as we continue to encounter Jesus together um, in community, uh, albeit from very far off. Uh, I couldn't be more grateful than to introduce our speaker for this morning, Pastor Corby Shields, who's going to be ushering us into Holy Week. Uh, Corby is the associate pastor at Rock Creek Fellowship, where he has served for the last six years. Uh, he and his wife, Rachel, have four kids, and I know that their family has been a huge blessing and had a huge impact on many of your lives. So now we're going to spend a couple of minutes in reflection and worship as Mark Perry leads us in music, and then we're going to hear from Pastor Corby Shields. I pray that you have a peaceful and blessed Holy Week. God, you have given us the commandment and um, the demand to not fear. 
even in times that are uncertain, even in situations that um, bring many questions without answers, God, you are sovereign and you are good. Please remind us daily and give us daily reason to remember your grace and your mercy and your love. Give us confidence to trust the plans that you have no matter what it looks like. We love you, Lord, and we bless your name. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Covenant College. It's a beautiful morning here on Lookout Mountain. Uh, so beautiful and sunny. In fact, I had a hard place finding uh, some somewhere to film this because uh, the light was so intense. So, since you've left, so is the fog. Thank you for bringing it with you. And uh, spring has sprung here on Lookout, and we miss you guys a lot. And uh, wanted to talk to you guys briefly today. I understand that this is recorded for chapel um, and the chapel taking place uh, after Palm Sunday. And so <clears throat> I wanted to take this time to kind of run through the last, uh, last few nights of Jesus's life. Uh, according to the Gospel of Matthew. Um, so I'm going to pray as we jump in. Father, uh, it feels strange to pray on a recording, but it is not strange for you. Um, we recognize that you have great plans for us as we encounter you in your word, as you draw close to us this morning. Amen. <coughs> I, I, uh, I think to start off a diagram may be helpful. It's a very simple one. This is a diagram of my life, my family life, and particularly the mornings. So in the mornings, I go for a run around my neighborhood. So if that's, if that's uh, the outer circle, that's my neighborhood. I go for a run around there. And then as is natural, as you would expect a human to do, I'd like to enter my home. That's the inner, that's that, that circle there. I like to go inside of my home after I go for a run. And um, that presents a problem. Just inside the home is a problem. The problem uh, shows itself when my kids do funny gestures like this. Hi, Dad. What are you doing? And they expect me to, to like move through the house. Uh, I have to go through the kitchen in order to get to my bedroom and, and the shower that will then relieve their distress at my coming near. And this, this circle right there, that, that tiny one in the middle represents um, a hug from my wife, which is not going to happen after I've come from the outside run and into the house and then into the center of closeness she she can't bear it which is very understandable and so i've got to go and get clean before i can come near because if i was going to come near in my certain my my post run state that's a cost that she is just not able to bear nor are my kids if i try and stop and get coffee if i try and stop and feed the dog if i try and stop they're just like nope go go get out oh that kind of pushed me out quickly. And I want to say that, um, that this same idea is, is Matthew's telling of the last few nights of Jesus' life. Um, but instead of it being an outside and in, uh, like I've said, um, we'll see in the life of Jesus in these last few moments of Jesus' life um, on earth that it's, it's an inside out. And so if you start, we're just going to do a, a broad sweep of, of that time period, and then I'll burrow down in one passage in particular. But if you start um, with the Last Supper, you have Jesus um, worshiping God by retelling the great Exodus story with his best friends. And I'm going to contend that that is a moment of intimacy and nearness, both with God and with his, his closest friends, the 12 disciples. Um, and so, so we move from the center. That is, that is, a, that is intimacy and nearness and, and companionship in the very center. And then we move uh, from there, Jesus and his disciples go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and they go to pray. And in that moment, 
uh, you have Jesus uh, in the garden pleading uh, with his father, distressed, he says, to the point of even death, sorrowful, um, but he's got his people around him. But what happens in that moment is you have Judas who's slipped away um, to go and, and betray Jesus. And so Jesus is betrayed by one who is supposed to be near to him. And he goes from, from that betrayal out uh, to, to a kangaroo court, to false accusations from the leaders, from the authorities who were supposed to be uh, the authorities of Israel, the, uh, the, the leaders, the ones who were supposed to cultivate a nearness to God and nearness to each other. And so Jesus is moving from that center point and he's moving out. Now he's in this false accusation court. But it gets worse. He's not only falsely, falsely accused by those who are supposed to care for the nation of Israel, they send him further out to be tried before Pilate, this goy, this outside evil force, this conquering power called Rome is now going to try Jesus and, uh, and decide whether he should live or he should die. And of course, um, that, that evil power decides that Jesus should die. And Matthew makes a point in the moment of his crucifixion. He says, as he was going out. And so, so Jesus is led from the center point at the Last Supper through betrayal by his own people into, um, into a trial by the wicked nations and he's sent out of the city, out of the city to be crucified. And as we see, this is uh, a common picture in all of scripture. Um, this kind of center point and, and concentric circle moving out. And so you've got the center point of, let's say, um, the tree in the middle of the garden, which was the, the point of covenant and, and, and nearness with God. And then you've got the garden. And then you've got the whole world surrounding it. So it's a concentric circle, but at the center is the point of focus of fellowship with God and with each other. And you have that same thing happening in the Holy Land. You've got the temple, Jerusalem, and then the, all of the Holy Land, and the, and the rest is, is the wicked nations, those outside of God's covenant. Um, and you even have uh, the Holy of Holies and the, the temple of uh, the court of the Jews and the court of the Gentiles, this concentric circle where we're moving towards holiness and mo moving towards uh, fellowship, intimacy, connection with God and with his people. Jesus is now moving away from that in this story of, of his crucifixion. And even as he moves out of the city of God, out far away from God's presence in the temple to be crucified, even in that moment, Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And we see Jesus moving away from intimacy, away from connection, into utter desperate loneliness. And even in that moment, even in that moment of Jesus crying out, it says in Matthew's Gospel that the curtain in the temple was torn in two. And so the curtain that, that barred access to the most holy place, you guys know this, the most intimate place of God's presence on earth, the connecting point of heaven and earth in the Holy of Holies was thrown open in Jesus' death. And so we, what we actually see is that the, as Jesus moves out like a strong man ripping down the gates. He moves out, but that access is granted for us to move in. And just like my wife is, <laughs> finds it so difficult to pay the price to be near to me and my uncleanness and my stench, Jesus and his moving outward pays the price for our moving inward, for our moving into intimacy with God, into connection with him. I want to take a minute then, like I said, and, and kind of burrow down on one of the passages because we hear this, that we're made for connection. We're made for nearness. We're made for, for relationship. We, we are made in the image of God. And so we have, uh, we're made in the image of a triune relational God. And that is, that is wonderful. I want to take just a second and take one of the little stories from this passage that we've just sprinted through 
and burrow down in it just for a second. This is from the prayer from, from Jesus when he moves from the Last Supper to uh, bringing his closest friends to the garden to pray. In his moment of distress, he says this, the, the passage says this from Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus went with them, his friends, his disciples, to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there to pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed. I want to point that out because I've always read that passage as Jesus going to the garden and then moving into prayer and inviting his disciples, particularly Jesus, uh, Peter, um, James, and John, the sons of Zebedee, to come with him so that they could pray. And do you remember, if you remember the story, they fall asleep and Jesus returns to, and I've always seen it as a rebuke. And he says to them, you stopped praying. You had a job. You were supposed to pray. You're supposed to do this thing. What I want to say is that in that moment, what is actually happening is much more like when you say, that gummit, I'm fat and lazy, and I've got to get exercising, but how am I going to do it? I know. I'll get a friend to do it with me. I'll get somebody else to help me, to be a companion to me. Because we all know that if we want to do something hard, then we do it much more effectively and consistently if we have somebody with us. And what is actually happening in this passage is not Jesus saying, you have a task to pray, but he's saying, I need you to be a companion to me in this difficult moment. I want you near to me. I value who you are, and I want you close. And Jesus is inviting you to that same nearness. As he goes out so that you can be brought in, your God is welcoming you. And he's saying, I want you. I want companionship with you. I want to work with you. I don't need you as a slave laborer. I want you as a co-worker. Jesus says, I don't call you servants. I call you friends. And he's invited you in to his very heart because he wants you, because he loves you. That is the kind of nearness. It's a, it's a nearness that is a, that's, keep watch. Be with me in my weakness. Be with me in my loneliness, in my fear. And, and our God invites us and says, be with me. Come close to me. He paid the price to have your company. He paid the cost to bring you near. I want to ask you, what is it going to cost you to bring the people in your life near to you? We're all, um, we're all in a moment in, in the world that is, that is uh, abnormal. Um, and a lot of us are uh, being required to stay put with certain people. Uh, maybe it's a roommate that you're being uh, asked to stay put with. Uh, for a lot of us, it's family, um, it's brothers and sisters, it's mom and dad. And I'm going to ask, what is it going to cost you to, to bring near into companionship those people who are with you? I think that is, uh, these are the people that it's the hardest to do that with. These are the people that, um, that uh, the little tiny difficulties of living with them uh, continue to resurface and resurface and resurface. And so you may forgive once, but then the next day or even the next hour, you have another, another uh, jangling opportunity to forgive yet again. And we're going to encourage you that the way of Jesus is to move out and invite them in, to move towards someone. I had a chance to walk with uh, he may kill me for this, for, with Cooper Hayes, um, a great student at Covenant, and we live in the same neighborhood. And so we took a walk the other day and talked all about what does it look like for us as we are uh, pushed together with our families to actually move towards people in new ways and break the patterns, break those dividing walls that have existed between siblings and between, um, between marriages. Uh, and it's going to be costly. It's going to require a sacrifice in the same way 
the Lord gave himself for you. He's asking you to travel that same path and break down those dividing walls of hostility like Ephesians 2 says that Jesus did for us. He gave us our access into to the Father, into nearness, even companionship. And as he goes, as he, as he sends to conclude the book of Matthew, in his resurrection, Jesus brings his friends with him together again, and he does give them a task. He says, go, and go to all the nations and bring them in. Bring them close to me. But he doesn't send you alone into that task. He says, I will be with you even to the end of the age. And it is a with you that is every bit as much a companionship of that garden where I want you. I want you close to me. I want to do this with you. And that's what he invites you to now. Will you go with him to bring the outsiders in, to, de to destroy dividing walls of hostility, even the ones that exist in your very home? I hope you will. It's good to be with you this morning. I'm going to close this in prayer. Father, we thank you that you sent your son to do the work to bring us near. Would you go with us? Would you draw us out that we would bring near the outsiders and take the risk and make the payment for the nearness of those you love so well? We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thanks for having me this morning. And I look forward to your return to campus, many of you. Talk to you soon. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly. Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. Be still, my soul. Shall you better know him?
Safe and blessed.